de Argentina, and I work along with Jovi Agustav, who also works in Education USA Argentina. And uh, thank you everybody for being here. If you have any questions regarding the, the, the application process in general, uh, that, um, or you need any help, uh, make sure to contact us as well if, if you need any help at all, okay? So thank you, uh, thank you guys, and the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you very much. And again, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, so we are, uh, we are all going to introduce ourselves so you know who you're talking to um, as we go through the content of this presentation. But we're here today to talk to you a little bit about um, understanding art schools and specifically understanding art schools in the, in the US. Um, so those of us that are presenting today, um, you can see here on the screen, but we're the voices you'll be hearing. Uh, my name is Mike. I am the Assistant Director of International Enrollment here at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, California. And my name is Sasha Walker. I am the Assistant Director of International Admissions at the College for Creative Studies, which is located in Detroit, Michigan. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Tidford. I am the Assistant Director of International Admission at Maryland Institute College of Art, or MICA, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi everyone, my name is Anita Bartwaj, and I am from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, located in downtown Chicago. And so uh, the reason why we're all gathered here to together today is because we are all ACAD institutions. ACAD is the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design, and it is an, a membership organization that has the 36 top art and design schools in both the US and Canada. So we highly encourage students to consider ACAD institutions when they are looking at art schools in the US. Um, and one of the main benefits of being an ACAD school is that we are all nationally accredited schools of art and design. So this is the NASAD accreditation, which we'll also cover later in our presentation about accreditations. Uh, but it is the National Association of Schools of Art and Design. And actively, we enroll about 50,000 undergraduate students across the 36 schools that are involved. And then as an ACAD institution, we also participate in what is called the ACAD Portfolio Review Portal, which is a free service where you can receive a portfolio review at any point, um, whether you're in grade 9, 12, or you graduated a few years ago, you can use this service to receive a free uh, portfolio review from any of the 36 schools. You can see which types of programs institutions offer and select those that you are most interested in, and you can choose up to 10 schools. So this is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more and understand where your portfolio is, but we also do have a portfolio presentation if you need help or assistance on building a portfolio. But now we'll just all introduce our individual schools so you have a little bit better of an understanding about us, and then we'll go into the actual meat of the presentation. Yes, thank you, Sasha. Um, so again, my name is Mike. I'm from California College of the Arts, or CCA. Uh, so we're, again, a fully accredited private nonprofit school here in the Bay Area. We've actually been around for over 100 years. Uh, we were founded during the arts and crafts movement. So we have a really um, strong bunch of programs in those craft and fine art based areas, furniture, glass, textiles, uh, jewelry, metal arts, photography, uh, painting and drawing. But because of our location and all this awesome stuff that's happened with design and technology, even architecture, we've been able to roll that into the things that we offer here at CCA as well. So things like animation, architecture, interior design, interaction design, industrial design, illustration, etc. Our top six programs are um, the five-year Bachelor of Architecture program, illustration, industrial design, animation, um, painting and drawing and graphic design. So overall, there are 20 undergraduate programs in those areas of art design, architecture, and writing. We do have some STEM designated programs and we'll talk a little bit more about STEM programs um, later on in the presentation. The benefit of an international student pursuing a STEM program in the US is the opportunity to extend your OPT upon graduation. So usually international students can stay in the country for one year, that OPT um, extension can allow you to stay for three years. So animation, interaction design, and architecture carry that designation here at CCA. 
We're a pretty small school, about 1,450 undergraduates, but very diverse. So about 42% of our students are coming from 50 countries around the world. Um, this has actually helped us be ranked one of the top 10 most diverse campuses in the US. Our location affords us uh, really great opportunities. Among those, we have over 200 companies a year physically coming to campus to work with our students. We also have students participating in over 600 internships a year. And because of uh, our faculty, Faculties, all pretty much uh, current practicing professionals working in industries and for companies that our students want to be a part of. So because we have small class sizes, our students are able to work really closely with instructors. For example, you might have an animation teacher who works at Pixar or a graphic design teacher who works at Google um, and really be able to learn from them quite closely. Uh, we've been ranked the number one art school in the nation for return on investment and being located in one of the top cities for creative talent in the world is also an added bonus for studying at CCA. We'll turn it over to Sasha. Thanks, Mike. So as I mentioned, my name is Sasha. I represent the College for Creative Studies, which is a four-year uh, College of Art and Design offering both bachelor's and master's degree. And we are proud to be located in Detroit, Michigan, which is in the Midwest of the US. And we're about a four hour drive from both Chicago or Toronto. Detroit does have a rich legacy of design and innovation, transforming the way the world has worked, moved and lived. And as an industrial powerhouse that fueled the rise of the automobile, it has been home to many different creatives. And Detroit was named the first and is currently still the only UNESCO city of design in the United States. And cities with this designation are all committed to using design as a tool for economic development. So we're extremely proud of this and we talk about it at all points. But on the screen, you'll see a list in the center of all of our undergraduate offerings. These are the programs that would, you would choose between. Um, and one thing that sets CCS a little bit apart from the rest of my art pod colleagues is that we are a direct entry school, which means you apply into a program and you start in that program your very first semester on campus. This is something we'll also cover later in the presentation. But from this list, our more popular programs are going to be animation, game design, or illustration. However, we have some more unique areas like concept design, which is designing characters, objects, and environments for feature animations or films, entertainment industry. So films like Guardians of the Galaxy, where they're designing the spaceships, the characters, the weapons, etc. We also have fashion accessories design, which is all about designing and creating shoes, hats, or handbags. And this program is transitioning into a full fashion program starting next year. And then of course, uh, due to our ties to the automotive industry, we are internationally known for our transportation design program. So this is designing both interiors and exteriors of vehicles. And we have a direct connection to three major automotive companies um, located in the Detroit metro area. And so on campus, we enroll about 1400 students uh, with a 10 to one student to faculty ratio. Um, much like CCA, we also have STEM designated programs. So we have seven undergraduate programs that have that STEM extension. Those would be communication design, um, product design, transportation design, and then all four of the sections in entertainment arts. So this is a very big benefit to students enrolled in that program. And then of course, uh, we are extremely career focused. And so we have a career development office that's dedicated to exposing students to professional development opportunities and resources that will aid them in identifying and obtaining their personal career goals. And so there are a number of opportunities that we connect to industry professionals and that could be things like internships, industry days, portfolio reviews, or corporate sponsored projects. And so at CCS, we have about 30 corporate sponsored projects each year, which is where a real um, company or a professional industry will come in and sponsor the project for 15 weeks. So it turns into essentially a real world 15 week job interview that can lead into scholarships or a full-time employment after the course. And so that's pretty much all I'll introduce about CCS. And Next up is Sarah and Micah. Thank you, Sasha. Um, all right, so the Maryland Institute College of Art, or MICA, is located in Baltimore, Maryland. And Baltimore is on the east coast of the US. It's about um, three and a half hours south of New York City. And Washington, DC is about 45 minutes away. 
um, driving or taking a train. So we're um, right there among all of those East Coast cities. Um, MICA is actually the oldest fully accredited degree granting um, College of Art and Design in the United States. So we were founded in 1826 and we have a long uh, rich history in both fine art and design fields. Uh, we're consistently ranked within the top 10, according to the US News and World Report, specifically number three in graphic design, um, three in sculpture and four in painting and drawing. Um, we also have very popular majors um, now in animation, illustration, product design, architecture, um, and many other fields as well. Uh, so as you can see, um, we have a, a beautiful campus, it's 30 buildings all together um, right in the heart of Baltimore City. And what makes MICA unique is um, that we have a very integrative, customizable curriculum. So a lot of students are integrating um, fields in art and design with other areas of study like science and technology, healthcare. Uh, we have a partnership with Johns Hopkins University, which is a very famous Ivy League school in Baltimore. And so many students are doing collaborations um, with different departments at Johns Hopkins. Also, we've really been put on the map um, for our entrepreneurship program as well. Uh, and entrepreneurship meaning um, anyone who is interested in actually developing your own company. So many times creative people, uh, instead of working in a specific company are developing their own. So we have an entire program just dedicated to that. Um, so with that also, um, we are very focused in career development. Uh, average of 95% of uh, students who graduate are successfully transitioning into the working world, employed full-time, part-time, or entrepreneurs. Um, and many are going on to uh, very well-known graduate programs as well. So we have about 3,500 total students. We're one third international. So we have um, students coming from 52 different countries. And um, it's a very small population, but it is very diverse and um, eclectic. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to Anita. Hi, everyone. So I'm from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in downtown Chicago, um, located kind of in the center of the, the top picture there on the left. Um, SAIC is, it was founded in 1866, and it is one of the most historically significant accredited independent schools of art and design in the U.S. Um, we are currently ranked in the top five of art and design schools in the U.S. for our undergraduate program. We're ranked, um, we're ranked in the top 10, and then for our graduate uh, program in fine arts, we're ranked number two. And then seventh globally. So we're really proud of that. We just found out that recently. Um, we also have programs that are specifically uh, ranked, um, such as fiber arts, painting, drawing, photography, printmaking, sculpture, and time-based, which is film and new media, including animation. Um, one of our claims to fame is the Art Institute of Chicago, which is called, which is the museum. And the museum actually holds the third largest collection of art in the entire world. And our students use this as a resource to uh, further their practice. Our, our instructors and professors use it as a teaching tool. Students are in and out, of, flowing in and out of the museum during their studio courses. There's a back entrance for the students. So they spend plenty of time around literally millions of pieces of art. Um, we have a modern wing also that students have access to. Um, the other thing that SAIC is known for is its interdisciplinary curriculum. So what that means is that we have no majors. And uh, this allows students to learn from 18 different departments and design their own specific course of, uh, of study and studio practice. We do have Pathways, which is a set of curriculum in our design concentrations, which include architecture, interior architecture, fashion, visual communication design, and designed objects, which is also known as uh, industrial design. We also have a very rigorous liberal arts uh, curriculum that is blended in with the studio courses. 
And uh, we, we truly believe that meaning is meaning equals making. So you'll get a combination of this one third, two thirds. So you'll spend two thirds of the time fully immersed in studio classes that are anywhere from four to six hours long with um, access to the museum during those, during those times when the museum is open and a third to that rigorous based uh, a liberal arts program. Also, we're, we're a critique-based assessment. So what that means is that there are no grades. So I say I see no, no majors, no grades. And we really truly believe that uh, critique and the exchange of critical discourse between your peers and faculty and uh, visiting artists is a way that you can further expand your, uh, your practice. The, and then we also have collaborations. Uh, we, our students enjoy collaborations with working on projects that are founded from the immediate design all the way to go to market. So you'll see these, these pro products on the shelf. So with Crate and Barrel, Ikea, CB2, Bosch, and Samsung, we have a kind of a very close relationship with the entrepreneurship community within the Chicago and outside the Chicago area. So that's it for us, AC. Excellent. Thank you, Anita. Um, so again, we are here to talk to you today about essentially studying art. So some of the topics we are going to cover are from the very simple, you know, what is art school and what are their differences? Can you really get a degree in art? Um, hint, the answer is yes. Uh, what can you study and can you get a job in the arts? And the answer to that question is also yes. We're gonna just more or less jump right in. Um, the first thing that we want to cover or we're going to talk about is accreditation. Um, so what does it mean and why does it matter? This is kind of the drier side of the higher education process, but essentially accreditation means that um, the education that you are receiving carries weight. Um, that as you can see here, there are different lists of accrediting boards and accrediting organizations. And essentially it means that everyone is held to a specific standard. So sort of what Sasha was talking about earlier with um, our ACAD organization, we all have sort of certain standards that we're being held to. This particularly helps if at some point you decide to transfer from one institution to another. It means your credits, the credits that you earned at the first institution can be recognized by the second institution. And it also means that if you complete an undergraduate program and you decide to pursue a graduate program, that that institution will recognize your undergraduate degree. So again, a little bit of the drier side of the admissions process for college or university, but it is very, very important. And that's one of the first things as you're doing research into schools, one of the very first things that you should take a look at. Um, within the U.S., there are seven regional accrediting boards, and you can see those listed there. Um, it pretty much just depends on where in the U.S. you're located as far as which one you would be eligible for. For example, here in California, we have um, a WASC accreditation. Um, and then there are also uh, national accrediting boards, and that's what you see listed there on the bottom. So generally, an institution will have two accreditations, one regional accreditation and one national accreditation. The national accreditation that art schools tend to have is that first one you see their NASAD or the National Association of Schools of Art and Design. So that's what all the ACAT institutions generally carry. Certain programs in some instances will have specific accreditations and that generally happens with um, architecture and interior design. Um, so you can see those listed here. Again, for example, um, CCA's uh, five-year Bachelor of Architecture program has that NAB accreditation. Um, some interior design programs will just fall under the NASAD accreditation and not a CETA accreditation. If you're concerned about that or you want to know reasons why as you're doing research, those are questions you can always ask the college, specifically working with an admissions counselor. Um, but one of the questions you should never hesitate to ask anybody, is your school accredited or what accreditation does your school carry? Um, and then uh, getting a little bit more general, where can you study art? There are obviously several different places where you could pursue the study of art. So one is at a traditional art school, sort of like what we all represent. Um, and art schools themselves can have a little bit of differences. So sometimes art schools will focus on just um, 
just one art form or a handful of different art forms. Um, there's also larger universities that will sort of have an art college within them. So the one I'll use because it's off the top of my head, Syracuse, uh, Syracuse University has an art college within it. So you would be going to Syracuse University, but studying within the art college. Um, you can also just get an art degree at a larger college or university. So that would be essentially usually maybe like a BFA in fine art degree at, um, you know, uh, University of South Florida or something to that extent. Um, and then similarly, um, well, that actually is the last point there, the liberal arts colleges that offer majors within the arts. So um, you can find an art program in a variety of different aspects or in a variety of different locations. And there can be pluses and minuses to where you might determine to study that art degree. And that's some of what we're going to talk to you about as well. So as far as the types of art schools, um, there's generally three types. So we have four-year art-focused institutions, again, which is what CCI, CCS, MICA, and SAIC are. And this is usually what most people think of when you say art school. Um, generally, we're pretty competitive, but the focus on the school will really be on your art-based major, um, your art-based sort of career, so career development resources and whatnot are all really revolving around creatives, art students. Um, the next would be, again, those art schools within larger colleges or universities that offer other types of degrees in general education. Um, so, you know, getting um, an art degree at USF in Florida or something like that, where you are part of a larger network of other types of programs in other areas. Um, you can generally take additional coursework outside of creative areas in these types of schools. Uh, because those programs are offered, right? So um, if you were really interested in psychology, you can take a psychology class in another part of the college, where at a place like CCA, we don't have psychology classes. You can take electives in other art making programs, and we do have humanities and science courses, as do all my other colleagues here today, um, but we don't have the same breadth of liberal arts options that you would find at a larger college or university. And then another option for a type of art school would be um, vocational schools or technical schools. These are generally focused more on a specific skill set. Um, generally, they're not accredited and they could also tend to be quite expensive. Um, because they're not accredited, their coursework is non-transferable. So that goes back to one of the first things that we were talking about. So it greatly limits your options to transfer to another institution or can greatly limit your options for uh, graduate school. And then similarly, the quality of the education that you're receiving can also be vastly different depending upon the, the institution or the school that you're attending. Um, we can talk a little bit more deeply about that later on if you have specific questions about that. Um, but in general, you know, comparing the first two to the last one, you're gonna get a much broader um, deeper education in the, the, a four-year art school or an art school within a college or university than you would at a vocational school or a technical school. Um, and then as far as those art schools go, um, there's usually a couple different philosophies that a school will subscribe to. One is a little bit more based on concept, right? So thinking a little bit more about um, ideas and theory and, and those kinds of things. So like pushing you to be a little bit more individualistic, um, to really focus on what, what you're trying to say maybe first and then figuring out how to say it. And another philosophy is a little bit more of a technical based program where not that you're not worried about what it is you want to say, but you're really focusing on specific types of skill sets, right? So maybe that is um, specific type of observational kinds of work in a painting and drawing program versus something that's a little bit more um, modern or conceptual. Um, or, you know, I had somebody ask me about like 
you know how you can tell when you're watching a movie if it's a Pixar movie, right? Pixar's generally got this pretty specific style to it. Um, that would be the same kind of idea where it's focused a little bit more on a style or on a technique versus the concept. Um, one is not better than the other. It's really just something to keep in the back of your mind if you're looking for an art school to see what you feel more drawn to, right? To that concept, or do you want to practice um, more technique? And some schools, um, and usually amongst our institutions here today, some schools sort of marry this a little bit um, together. So it's not necessarily just one or the other, but there can be a combination of the two. So now I'll take us into the differences between a Bachelor's of Fine Arts or a Bachelor's of Arts. So oftentimes people are asking, what is the true difference between these? Because many schools may offer both or they may be seeing a BA at one of those larger universities rather than a BFA being offered. Um, but one of the biggest uh, differences is how it is based on studio art or more based in theory and liberal arts. So a bachelor's of fine arts degree is going to be two thirds of the coursework dedicated to art and design courses. So it's more hands-on, more time in the studio, and typically you're creating more artwork from a BFA program in comparison with a Bachelor's of Art, which is going to be one third of the coursework focused towards the actual studio arts. So they're going to have more theory and more liberal arts courses for a BA degree versus more studio art courses for a Bachelor's of Fine Arts. And so there are the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so there are a number of different majors that you can study at schools. Um, and like Mike had covered, these majors may be available at a university. They may be available at a specific art school. But this is just a snapshot of some of the overviews. Um, obviously, every school has a slightly different name for their programs. Uh, so it's always good to ask a, a general question of, do you have a graphic design program if you're not seeing it on the list because it may be called something else. I know that's how it is at my institution. Our graphic design program is called communication design. Um, sometimes our department chairs just like to change the name to better encompass what they're teaching. And I know that is oftentimes confusing for students. Um, but there are also like subcategories within certain areas. Like if you think about animation specifically, there's 2D animation or 3D animation or digital animation. So there's lots of different aspects that may be within one area, but it's always great to reach out to the individual schools you may be considering, oftentimes because there is a lot that is inside each individual major that you may need to learn more about. And also keep in mind that some art schools may have creative writing majors or they may have um, other programs that are similar to um, like sound design or working with a variety of other aspects beyond just visual arts. Uh, but those may be a completely different type of degree or oftentimes you can add on a minor in many of these other areas along with liberal arts minors like creative writing or art history. So if you have multiple areas of interest, you can typically do some kind of major minor combination when studying at school. And then there are a few different types of curriculum uh, that these schools offer. So it's, again, always great to communicate with the school you're considering or doing research. Uh, it'll help you better understand exactly what kind of education you would receive if you did attend that school. So the first type is going to be a focused or technical program, which is where you apply directly into your major and you start in that program your first year. So this is what CCS is. Like I mentioned before, we are direct entry. Whereas there may be a, major, or a curriculum that's concept-based where the majors are flexible and students can um, change their interest based on, or change their courses based on their interests. This would be a little bit more like SEIC where they don't have majors. So you have that flexibility between it because it's all about the concepts and what studio courses you prefer to take. And then finally, we have the concept and technique based programs, which are schools that develop the craft and push conceptual thinking. And oftentimes these years have a a dedicated first year foundation program where freshmen are in all of the same courses before they go into their major starting in their second year. So that would be more like MICA and CCA. 
So we're all a little bit different. We all kind of touch on different curriculums, but we do have a lot of similarities across the board. So again, asking each school what their curriculum breakdown is like. I know that we all have curriculum charts that show exactly what is required for the degree. So it's worth asking those questions to understand what your courses would be. And then moving into the application step, um, every school is going to be different. So this is something we are going to reiterate. We talk about this in all our presentations. Every single one of us have a slightly different application process, but it is similar. So first of all, you'll want to apply to the school. And the application sometimes could be a common app. I know that Micah uses common app. Um, CCI, I think, CCI, I think, yeah. So um, everyone besides me pretty much uses common app, but my school has a dedicated direct application on our website. So this is, again, what you'll want to research and think about your process. I often say that you should start a spreadsheet of all the schools you're considering. You can write down whether they're common app or direct application, what their application requirements may be, and etc. And that way you just have all your ducks in a row when it comes time to apply to schools. And so all of these schools, or at least the schools that you'll probably want to most consider, will be looking for a portfolio submission. Uh, this is a very important part of the art, art school application. Um, I often tell a student that if a school wants to see your portfolio coming in, they'll want to make sure your portfolio is strong going out. So it's a, it's a skill building. We want to make sure that you have the foundation that we can then build you up in order to prepare you for those careers and opportunities after graduation. And then um, there are some schools who do require letters of recommendation, and these will be letters that have been written by someone who knows you personally. It typically should not not be a family member, but it will be someone like a school administrator or a teacher or someone who you have been working with for a very long time who is a professional. So that could be someone that you work with or et cetera, like your boss. But um, typically they'll want to be speaking about your work ethic or your artistic abilities so that the admissions office has that information to go off of. And then there are some schools who will also require an essay or an artist statement. Again, each individual school may have different requirements for that. So please connect with um, each individual um, admissions representative or their website will outline exactly what they're looking for. I also do know like some of our colleagues, um, they may also have writing prompts as part of their application process. So always check each school um, because you don't want to start the application process and realize that you don't have the requirements in order to complete the process, especially by the deadlines that may be approaching. And then of course, finally, we do want to see um, proof of English proficiency. So that could be through a variety of different um, exams, but mostly we want to look at TOEFL, IELTS, or Duolingo, and our minimum score requirements are different per institution. So again, something to add to that spreadsheet you have. So that's just a general overview of what the application process may be like, but now I'm gonna pass it over to my friends to talk about portfolio. Thank you, Sasha. Um, all right, so um, I will definitely echo a lot of what Sasha um, mentioned already in the application requirements. Um, for, uh, as Sasha said, um, for the schools that are nationally accredited, um, the top ranked schools, the portfolio will definitely be the number one most important part of your application. Um, you know, we certainly love to see strong academics as well, but, you know, being um, an art school, we want to see um, your creativity, we want to know what your skill sets are like. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, um, what uh, the best thing that you can possibly do is to get a portfolio review, and there's multiple ways of doing that. Um, you can certainly reach out to us individually uh, to schedule um, portfolio reviews. 
All of us as admission counselors are here to help and support you. So um, because every school has kind of individual requirements, uh, getting a portfolio review can really get you familiar with what those requirements are. And, um, and you know, even if you are um, early in high school, if you're in uh, ninth, 10th, even 11th grade, we can give you some uh, advice and tips on how to build your portfolio out to make the best one possible. Um, so on this slide, I would just like to point out um, the bottom two um, links that you see here, Slide Room and National Portfolio Day. Um, Slide Room is the platform that many of the schools use to upload portfolios. And um, the organization that we mentioned early in the presentation, ACAD, has a wonderful resource where you can actually upload your portfolio to Slide Room completely free of charge. And uh, it's about five images that you can upload. And um, you can select from any of the ACAD schools to get feedback. Um, so when you upload the portfolio, you just check off MICA, CCA, CCS, and SAAC, and any other schools that interest you. And we will review your work and email you back um, with feedback. So highly recommend doing that. There are also um, events that happen throughout, uh, usually the fall and a few in the spring, um, through the National Portfolio Day Association, and the, the link is there as well. Um, and basically, the platform there is most of the ACAD schools will participate. Of course, everything is virtual these days. Um, but that does make it more accessible for you if you are international. Um, and you come um, to the event with your portfolio and again, select which schools interest you the most. So highly recommend doing those. Next slide. Mike, can you see if you can uh, refresh really quick? I don't know if that's a problem. <laughs> There's just a few um, extra things in there. Um, so, um, while Mike is doing that, um, just to reiterate what Sasha mentioned um, and all of us have, have said before, every school is a little bit different. Generally speaking, um, we do love to see um, your skills. So if you are not currently taking art classes, start taking them now. Um, and the art classes that you can take um, can be in the, the high school that you're attending, um, or it can, perfect, thank you. Um, or it can also be um, a number of pre-college programs. Um, many schools offer pre-college programs. Um, all of us do. And those are um, programs that you can take in um, our summer time. So that would reflect, I guess, in your winter time. Um, but there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Uh, but regardless, if you um, don't have uh, access to art classes in your own school, take them outside of school if you can. I would definitely avoid um, just relying on like YouTube tutorials and that sort of thing, because that sort of directs you um, to a very specific kind of art making that may not be the most original. So here um, you can see generally what a fine art and or design portfolio will require. Most schools want to see um, between 10 and 20 uh, pieces of artwork, um, generally speaking finished, but um, some schools do really love to see process work as well. And that is uh, sort of individual to the work. Um, we love to see um, the level of thought and ability as well. Um, so, you know, to see not only that you are thinking about, um, you know, the skills that you're developing, but also concepts as well. Um, so we like to see knowledge of color theory, composition, um, the things that you sort of learn in a foundation, um, you know, art one kind of context. Um, you can certainly have a variety of subject matter um, that can really be beneficial, but just to see that you're exploring lots of different concepts. Um, but we also really do love to see sort of obsession about certain things as well. Um, and, you know, with all of the work that you're making, sort of get comfortable talking about it and thinking about it, because in Slide Room, there is a whole section for you to upload um, information about that piece. There's like a little description section um, where you can tell us a little bit about what inspired you, um, what materials you used, um, you know, if it's part of a series, if you were influenced by, you know, another artist, that sort of thing. 
Um, and, you know, just to get down to the nuts and bolts, um, some schools do require observational drawings. Um, so you can think uh, like still life or figure drawings. A little pointer about that is, um, you know, if you are drawing observationally, draw things that you love and draw things that you are engaged in. Um, it will make it much more interesting than um, something that is copied or something that is, uh, you know, objects that aren't really important to you. Um, all types of media are welcome. So two-dimensional, three-dimensional, moving images, 4D. Um, we love to see again and that balance of skill and conceptual ability. And the most important thing is your creativity. We love to see a strong personal voice. Um, so the work can be um, specific to a major. Um, again, this is gonna be specific to the school, but it can also be very general. Um, so we do not expect for you to be an expert in your field already. Um, we don't expect that you're going to have a full line of fashion designs or you're going to have, you know, buildings that you've built as an uh, architecture uh, major. We want to see, you know, the strong foundations. Next slide. Um, and for those of you who are interested in film, um, there are some sort of specifications there. Uh, we love to see the moving image, um, certainly. You want to make sure to follow the time guidelines. So typically speaking, um, it should be less than, than five minutes per piece that you're, you're making. Um, that's just because, you know, we see thousands and thousands of portfolios and we can't watch a feature length um, film or five of them. <laughs> um, even though we would love to. Uh, and we love to see a sense of storytelling. Um, you know, we love to see that you are really building on um, narratives and that you're really thinking about, you know, character development. You're thinking about, um, you know, how the, the story is, is flowing from one end to another. Um, and if you're interested in writing or directing, um, submit pieces that, that really show off those skills. So obviously any film um, that you watch, a professional film is going to have, you know, hundreds of people working on it. Um, so just think about which component of that you're really interested in. So, you know, the production value um, matters way less than a good story. So because we, know that you don't have an entire film crew working for you, um, we're not anticipating that the production is going to be top quality. So um, we are much more interested in, you know, seeing those uh, sort of narrative abilities and really thinking also about the visual aspects of composition. Um, now, certainly, uh, I know that many students do work collaboratively, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, just make sure, like, in the credits that you let us know which part you took, um, that you were responsible for. So if you were doing the editing exclusively, you know, make sure you let us know that so we can see your skill sets uh, as far as that's concerned. I think that is it. Move on to Anita. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> So the million dollar question, can you get a job in the arts? And the question is, and the answer is yes. Yes, you can. In fact, creative, uh, creative employment is growing ex exponentially. And um, it's one good thing that's come out of COVID is that there are a lot of opportunities virtually where students have not had access to, um, to regions and, and careers, and they do now because many of the jobs are virtual. This, this page here is just a really small snapshot of where our graduates from all of our schools have landed, whether they've interned at these places or they eventually intern to job placement. Um, the good news is, is that um, our students, our graduates are being placed at higher rates um, year after year. And each one of these logos kind of represents either an internship opportunity which you're gonna to want to definitely check into. Most students that go to art school enjoy anywhere from one to four internships over the course of their time in art school. And the idea there is to really get an experience of what real world, you know, what the real world is like in creative fields. So students often uh, take internships at small smaller places and then try medium and then larger, or they completely do, you know, they may do a gallery and then go into product design just to experiment um, before they graduate. So I highly suggest that you do that. The other thing that I would suggest is that 
each college that you apply to, each art school that you apply to, especially if you're uh, applying to ACAD schools, which I highly recommend, have uh, each one of those universities has a career department. And you're gonna want to connect with the career department your first year that you're there, and then continue to connect with the career department over the course of your four years. Um, their sole purpose in life is to help you prepare for life after art school. Or, light, or into graduate school. So whatever bridge that you're, you know, you're crossing next, they're there to help prepare you. They'll help prepare you, your, um, help you with your resume. They will help you with your website. They will help you with career searches. Um, they will help you kind of develop your CV as you are developing as an artist. Um, and the reason why I'm saying to connect with them early is that they can really help you over the course of time. They can help you curate your work so that you're showing the best work for a particular position or internship that you're looking, uh, looking to get to. The other thing is that if you're interested in graduate school or you're interested in writing a grant or a proposal, or if you're interested in a residency opportunity, uh, your career office is the place to go for th that type of support. Next. So here's some numbers for you. The good news is that creative uh, employment in the creative field is growing exponentially. So you can see there's some pretty big numbers here. Um, I won't go through every single bullet here, but the idea is that uh, companies and corporations, even smaller entrepreneurship efforts are, are looking for creativity more than anything else. You know, this is something that is specific. This is a critical thinking skill that's transferable to uh, any corporation. You think about, I know Mike likes to say the chair that you're sitting in, you know, the, um, the pencil that you're using, the appliances in your kitchen, you know, everywhere you look, there is, there every single object that you look at, an artist has had some sort of um, connection or input on that, on that piece. So um, continue to, like I said, connect with your career department once you get there. You can also contact them before you even um, get admission into the school. Uh, they're willing to talk to you about the programs that they have, the events, how they can connect you with alums in the, in the field and um, prepare you for life after art school. Next. Okay, so here's a list of just a very, very small list of where many of our graduates end up and the titles of the jobs that they end up with. The one thing that um, to take into consideration, say you're interested in animation. Animation is pretty broad. There are a thousand different jobs within an animation field. There are artists that work on color all day long for animators and that's all they do. So if you're obsessed with color and you're obsessed with animation, you know there's a very specific job in within the animation field um, that deals with color. Um, you can do things like their interior design, um, UX, software engineer, uh, prop stylist, sculptor, all of these types of things. The important thing to understand is that the critical thinking skills that you you could develop in an art school environment are transferable. You know, I've had students that have have concentrated in painting and drawing and end up as UX designers. So they are looking at you know the screen as a canvas, organizing by color and hierarchy. They're still they're applying those design principles to a very different field um, off the canvas. So the important takeaway here is that yes, you can you, you can get a job after art school. There are a plethora of jobs and that your skills are transferable into many different areas. Next. So this is a, a kind of a top 10 list of industries from our recent alums from all of our schools. So architecture, design, performing arts, advertising, internet, movies, government, other, you know, telecom and in healthcare. Healthcare is one of those really booming fields where they're looking at not only, um, you know, on the online experience, but they're also looking to designers to help develop and design equipment. Um, so you're thinking about like the ultrasound machine or the x-ray machine or the bed that you're sitting on when you go to the, you know, go, go to the hospital, those types of things, all of those medical, uh, surgical instruments, all of those are um, have a designer or an artist has, has touched them in some way. 
Okay. So I'll give it back to Mike. Yeah. Um, thank you, Anita. Um, so just to sort of round things up, um, if you have somebody, as you can tell, the slide is a little bit more for parents, but if you have somebody that, you know, is encouraging you to go into STEM or, you know, again, feels like art and design is maybe not um, a viable or a smart path for you, um, these are some things um, you can take a screenshot of this slide if you want, um, or again, you can talk to counselors at different schools, you know, when you're getting to that point. Um, but these are, are things that are important to keep in mind. Um, a good chunk of students who start in STEM fields don't actually, um, don't actually finish in those programs. And if you're still getting pushback, again, something else to think about. Um, art schools have STEM programs. And just, you know, based on what I've shared and what Sasha has shared, you know, and what you're seeing here, architecture, animation, industrial design, um, those things can be STEM designated. Um, a good majority of art and design alumni who intend to work in art and design fields actually do. Um, and you can see that uh, figure there, that 74% of alum um, compared to 58% in biology, 56% in accounting, and 53% in engineering. Um, so again, not to read all these statistics at you, but that outlook for careers on art and design is really um, pretty impressive. So I did, I think that was the last slide, right? Or did I skip something? Oh yeah, one more. Um, there are, to, to go back to some of what Anita was saying um, and something very important to keep in mind, um, the education that you receive at an art and design school makes you really sort of flexible in the different type of career. So when you saw that list of different types of job titles our alumni have, um, you'll notice there were things on there that we don't necessarily offer degrees in, right? Everything from CEO to librarian. Um, but those are things that creative students, creative alumni can do. And that's really applicable to this first point. Um, you know, over half of STEM workers don't have a degree in STEM. So having an art background doesn't automatically remove you from that type of career. Um, you know, a lot of people who are successful in these various fields, um, even STEM fields, have that creative type of background. And that's because creative thinking is the number one valued leadership quality in industries pretty much, you know, everywhere. And where better to um, foster that creative ability that you already have and work on those types of skill sets that are, are already inside you than in an art and design degree. So um, that's just sort of where we wanted to kind of wrap up the presentation. I know we're running close to time, um, but we did wanna make sure that um, you have an opportunity to ask questions if you'd like. Our contact information is here on this slide. So please, again, take a screenshot of this or, or jot our contact info down. Um, there was also a link put into the chat box. If you would like any more information about any of our schools, um, click on that link and fill out that form and we'll keep in touch with you. Um, but now if you have any questions, feel free to um, turn your mic on and ask or you can toss it into the chat and we are happy to answer. I think we're all also going to put our contact info in the chat just so that you have it if anyone wanted to like save it. But it does look like there is a question. Um, so if, oh, scrolled past. <laughs> if I want to do a grade in art, I should have an undergraduate in USA or can I do it with the title of Argentina? So I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, I think they're referring to a master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to have an undergraduate degree from the U.S. to study a graduate program in the U.S. Um, that's something you'll, again, you'll want to connect with, um, with the graduate program, with the school that you're interested in, just to make sure you're understanding their requirements. Um, but usually, as long as you have completed an undergraduate program, um, you know, you're eligible to apply 
for a graduate program in the US. So I don't necessarily worry about where your undergraduate degree is from. So for anyone interested in um, graduate programs, a really awesome resource that I'm sure Education USA can tell you everything about is um, the Fulbright Scholarship. Um, I know tons of students um, come to all of our schools, I think, um, from Fulbright programs, and they're difficult to get. They're not easy um, to apply for, but um, if you are really motivated and, and really interested, um, <clears throat> it, it pays for everything. It pays for um, all of the tuition, I think even stipends for room and board and that sort of thing. So definitely look into Fulbright. Just a perfect segue into the next question about international students receiving financial aid or scholarship. Um, in general, um, yes, international students are eligible for scholarship. This also can, as far as amount of aid and what the processes are and whatnot, will be dependent upon the type of institution. Um, my colleagues here today, you know, we all offer merit scholarships for our international students. Um, in general, all you have to do to be considered is apply to be um, in that running. Um, we're looking again, as we mentioned before, at your portfolio and your academic performance for the most part to determine that. Um, some of us have deadlines, some of us don't have deadlines with that, but in general, an institution will provide um, scholarship for international students. International students, unfortunately, are not eligible for what we would traditionally consider financial aid. Um, so usually when you hear that term financial aid, it's more for a domestic student pursuing like federal monies and federal aid from the U.S. government. So international students aren't eligible for that. Um, usually, and kind of just speaking for, for art schools in general um, or ACAD schools, usually we're unable to fully fund international students through merit scholarship. Um, so definitely, um, and Anita just put a, uh, some information into the chat, it's always a good idea to look for additional sources of aid. So um, these, these websites are a great place. Um, some institutions will also list these websites and um, comparable things. So independent research into scholarship opportunities is certainly something that you'll want to keep in mind. And also keep in mind that outside scholarships do tend to have deadlines that are in the fall or early spring. So it's best to look at scholarships starting in the academic year that you plan to apply rather than the plan the year you plan to start because that is a huge thing where students tend to miss out on scholarships because they're looking say right now for the fall semester rather than looking last year for this upcoming fall semester. Oh, is this a MICA specific question? Yeah. I have a question about scholarships. I was searching about MICA scholarships and the page was broken. Oh no. And the mic yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if there was an issue with the website. I know that they're constantly doing um, updates on that. So I'll, I'll definitely let our school know if there is something up with that. But um, yeah, just to echo um, what Mike said, um, we also offer merit scholarships. And when we say merit scholarships, what that really means is, you know, we're looking at your, your grades, we're looking at your transcript, but most, most, most importantly, we're looking at the quality of your portfolio, um, which is why it's super important to start um, as early as you can and get as much feedback and, and really stay in contact with us as much as possible. So, um, so yes, the short answer is yes, we absolutely have scholarships and, um, you know, please reach out to us to um, get more information and a portfolio review. Oh, thank you, Sasha. <laughs> Good questions. And I do know, I'm just also going to generally speak in regards to master's programs. I don't know about all of our schools, but typically our institutions also offer merit scholarships for graduate programs. 
Um, so that again is very similar to the undergraduate application process where you submit all the items and then an admissions decision and or scholarship decision is made. Okay, so any other last minute questions before we end the session? Okay, I think, I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us. If you have, you know, if you think of something later, you can certainly email us. Of course, and we can also help if you need anything at all regarding the application process, if you need help, if you need us, you know, with advice as well, or, uh, you know, resources uh, you're not alone guys in this process or if you need translations whatever that it is that you need we can help you you're not alone doing all this <laughs> uh, so thank you mike sasha sarah and anita for for this presentation we always get questions about our programs and it's it's nice to have you here uh talking to our our students so thank you very much Okay. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Of course.